Okay. So welcome everyone to the Fraser Valley Conservancy's Nature Stewardship School. Um, this is our wildlife and winter webinar where you're going to learn how Fraser Valley critters survive in the cold and ways that you can help. And so uh, today your hosts are going to be uh, myself. I'm Tamson Baker. I'm the stewardship coordinator with the Fraser Valley Conservancy. And joining me here today is Alicia Switzer. She's project biologist. She's waving at you um, with the Fraser Valley Conservancy. Um, and so you'll probably notice you're all muted. Um, that's the way it is going to stay. Um, but and we please, there will be time for questions. So we're going to suggest that you do your questions um, in the chat. That's a great way. And then we'll read them and, and answer them the best we can. Um, and uh, so as we get rolling here, just wanted to acknowledge that the Fraser Valley Conservancy does its work um, in the, well, in, on the um, traditional territory of the Stolo First Nation. Um, the Stolo, Stolo means river, and uh, the people of the river have been stewarding in this land for many generations. And so today, uh, we're here to share knowledge and stories and learn about ways that we all can be caretakers of this land. So now, since we do have quite a few people here, some familiar and some new, you, some of you may not have heard about the Fraser Valley Conservancy. And so just to give you a quick overview, um, the Fraser Valley is, uh, the Conservancy is the local Fraser Valley uh, Charitable Land Trust. We've been around since 1998. Um, and our vision is to protect and enhance the natural areas in the Fraser Valley. And we do this to benefit native species, ecosystems and local communities. Um, the activities we focus on tend to be land related. So land stewardship and land securements. Uh, and we do lots of different uh, really interesting projects. I encourage you to check out our website and you'll learn a lot more about the different things that we do. So going back to, so today, um, this is our agenda for today. Um, so what we're gonna do is uh, um, Alicia's gonna kick things off to talk about how Fraser Valley critters survive the winter. And then I'm gonna talk about how you can help them not just survive, but thrive. And then we'll wrap up with sort of where the Nature Stewardship School is, is going from here. Um, and just again, I want a reminder that everyone is muted. Um, it's got quite a few of you here and uh, that you're free to ask questions, but uh, please ask them in the chat box. And Alicia and I will, will do our best to, to monitor that. So uh, with that being said, we also will have a bit of fun. So there's gonna be some surveys tonight, some questions to be answered. We want some participation from you guys. So this is gonna be our first experiment with this. So it's question time. We would like to know where you all are from. Where are you, where are you today? So a, a poll should have popped up on your screen. Please, please pick where you're from. We'll just give it a little bit of time. Let everyone fill it out here. Okay, we'll give it some time. Great. I see if you're still more participating here. Okay. What do you think, uh, Alicia? Should we? I think. Ah, uh, yes. So it's asking Abbotsford, Chilliwack, Mission, Langley, Metro Vancouver, outside of Metro Vancouver. Okay. Great. Um, well. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll we'll close the poll now. Great. So it looks like a lot of you are from the Fraser Valley. Fantastic. Um, but also you have welcome from Metro Vancouver and even a few uh, went outside of Metro Vancouver. So welcome everyone. This is great. Um, wonderful. So okay. Um, so that's that's you guys did that great. We'll have a few more of those coming up. And um, now I'm going to shop. Uh, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass things over to Alicia, who is going to kick things off with her presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Tamson. Hi, everybody. I'm Alicia Switzer. It's great to have you with me today. And I am going to start sharing my screen now to show you how Fraser Valley critters survive the winter. So let's go. All right. So wildlife in winter, how Fraser Valley critters survive the cold. 
So we're going to be talking about survival strategies and survival strategies have evolved over thousands of years here in the Fraser Valley to help our species cope with the changing seasons. And some strategies evolved millions of years ago, like fur. So here we have an early ancestor, the cynodonts, they were early mammals, and their fur evolved 225 million years ago. So that's a long time for that survival strategy to be around. So right off the bat, we're gonna get you thinking about surviving in the winter. So it's question time. We are going to ask you, which one of these strategies are only available to humans to survive in the winter. Which of these strategies is something only humans can use to survive the winter? Going on a vacation, changing into a warm coat, finding shelter, turning up the furnace, or stocking the pantry. Only humans can do this. Give you a couple more seconds here. Wait for the final results to come in. Getting all warmed up. All right, I'm gonna close the poll. And, ah, most of you, I see, have the same thing in mind, turning up the furnace. And yes, absolutely, only humans can turn up the furnace. But really, what I want you to think about is going on a vacation, changing into a warm coat, finding shelter, stocking the pantry. These are all survival strategies that critters in the Fraser Valley can use. And there are some unique strategies that humans just can't do, like having completely different life stages, mastering metabolisms, hibernating and brumating. So let's examine these eight strategies together and learn about Fraser Valley critters in the cold. And we'll start with number one, migrating. And many Fraser Valley critters migrate seasonally. And an example of that is our western toad. They'll migrate from the forests to the pond to lay their eggs and then they'll come back to the forest to spend the winter. And it's a pretty short distance. Some Fraser Valley critters travel long distances, like sockeye salmon. You can see that salmon travel over 2,000 kilometers from the coast to feed in the summer. And then when they're adults, come all the way back inland to lay their eggs. When it comes to winter migrations, there's one type of bird that's a popular topic of discussion, and that is the hummingbird. And that takes us to question number two. So this question says, the two most common hummingbirds in the Fraser Valley are Anna's hummingbird and Rufus hummingbird. Which of the following is true? Both Anna's and Rufus stay year round. Anna stays and Rufus leaves. Rufus stays and Anna's leaves or both hummingbirds leave. So let's test your hummingbird knowledge. What do you think? Get those votes in. How do these critters survive the winter? Stay, go. Couple more seconds here. All right, we're ending the polling now. Here we go. Ah, so a majority of us chose Anna stays and Rufus leaves, but there are quite a few of us who aren't sure. So let's see what the answer is. Ah, the answer is B, the Anna's hummingbird stays and the Rufus leaves. So why do two species of hummingbirds have different winter behaviors? 
the answer is a quick adapter versus a long-term planner. So Anna's Hummingbird is a quick adapter. It actually started out in California and only arrived in BC in the 1940s. And this is believed to be because of the non-native flowering plants and the sugar water feeders that are now available to them. They're commonly found in urban habitats, so areas that are quite different where they can adapt to non-natural habitat types. And their populations are increasing. The rufous hummingbird, on the other hand, leaves for the winter. And it actually undertakes the longest migration in the world when you compare body size to distance traveled. They overwinter in Mexico and the Gulf states and breed up here in our Pacific Northwest rainforests. Their migration is timed with the blooming of our native plant species, like the red flowering currant and salmonberry. So they're very tuned in to our native cycles here and the native plants we have and their populations are decreasing. Again, it's suspected that's largely because a lot of the native habitats here have changed so much. Let's talk about another strategy, like changing your coat. When you don't wear clothes, what does that look like? Well, you could grow a thicker coat, like our coyotes do. Or you could gain an extra layer of insulating downy feathers, like our resident geese. So many Canada geese migrate, but the geese that stick around get an extra layer of down to keep them warm in the winter. One of the best ways to survive winter is really just to find a safe spot. And this can be a strategy all on its own or part of another strategy that you use. Our Northwestern salamanders hide away all winter long. When their ponds freeze over, and it would be really chilly to stay in the snow, you'll find them under logs on the forest edge where they can be safe. Salmon have another unique hiding spot and that's under gravel. So we had salmon come up and breed in our streams just a few weeks ago. You might find salmon bodies in the stream still, but the eggs that they laid actually hide in the gravel, some of them hatch out. And it's important for them to have all of that rock and gravel habitat available so they can stay safe in the winter. Stocking up the pantry, not just for people, critters do it too. They hide food in small caches like our Douglas squirrel and our red-breasted nuthatch here. That way they have food that's available for them when it's hard to find food in the winter. Another strategy would just be to create a huge stockpile of food for the whole family. And the Fraser Valley stockpile expert is also a master engineer. Do you know who that could be? Let's find out. It's question time. I'm going to ask you who you think the Fraser Valley animal famous for massive winter stockpiles is also an expert builder. Could it be the Douglas squirrel, the North American beaver, the pileated woodpecker, or the northern red-legged frog? Famous Fraser Valley animal is an expert builder and makes huge stockpiles. A couple more seconds for our last votes here. All right. So we did learn that the Douglas squirrel can make these little caches of food, but the expert builder really is the North American beaver. And beavers around here make those big lodges like the one you see in the photo. And that isn't just a home, but also a place where they can store food. You see, beavers, they eat the bark off of tree branches, and they'll eat that all winter long. And a great place to store your branches is underwater so they don't get frozen. So this nice, warm beaver lodge is a great place to have your snacks and your home all in one. 
All right, our next strategy is hibernating, sleeping your worries away. And here in the Fraser Valley, we have a famous hibernator, the black bear. And hibernation is really about going to sleep for the winter. You gain lots of weight in the fall, eating as many berries and salmon as you can. And then while you're asleep, the fat is burned to keep the body warm enough to survive. When you're asleep, you use a lot less energy too. So it's a good strategy to use to survive the winter. We also have other hibernators here that you might not typically think about, like big brown bats. Bats will hibernate in rock crevices, in caves, and sometimes in buildings too. Now, brumation is something that a lot of people haven't heard about. And this is a survival strategy for cold-blooded critters. When you look at the graph here, we can see the top line is for the mouse. When your body temperature stays consistent, like a warm-blooded animal, it doesn't really matter what the environmental temperature is. When you're a cold-blooded critter, like the lizard, your body temperature depends on the environmental temperature. And take a look at what happens when it gets really cold. The lizard's body temperature also gets super cold. And this is when they enter a state called brumation. You're awake, but your body's so cold, you can't move very much. So, question time. Again, we're thinking about Fraser Valley critters. So, which of these Fraser Valley critters would brumate? It's multiple choice, so select all of the critters you think would brumate. Western painted turtle, common garter snake, Pacific tree frog, rough skin newt. Which of these would brumate? Give you a second to think about that. Lots of votes coming in, this is great. Just a couple more seconds here. And the reminder that if you have questions during this, you can put them in the chat and we'll try and answer them when Alicia's done her section. All right, we're gonna end the poll. Ah, so lots of votes for garter snake and rough skin newt couple votes for tree frog and western painted turtle. Let's see what the answer is. Well, all of these critters would brumate. These are all cold-blooded critters. Critters whose body temperature relies on the outside temperature. Western painted turtles are going to brumate underwater in the mud. That's where they'll spend the winter. Garter snakes are going to brumate, be cold and sleep in dens, in rocks, and in these burrows where they can stay underground and warm. The Pacific tree frog, they're going to be brumating in, again, rock crevices, old mammal burrows. You may also find them in the siding of your house or somewhere close to you that they can stay warm. Rough skin newts are able to go back and forth between the pond and the forest, but since they're so cold, they can't move very fast, so they have to be careful. All right, our next one is to master your metabolism and eat like there's no tomorrow. Some animals keep themselves warm by generating their own heat constantly, but how do they get the energy to shiver all day and through the night? Well, they spend all day eating, like dark-eyed junco or the mule deer. And there's a master of spending all day eating, and that is our resident black-capped chickadee. They eat up to 60% of their body weight every day to stay warm and create fat reserves. Could you imagine eating more than half your body weight every single day? They cache food and remember feeding spots. 
thousands of different spots. These birds have an amazing ability to remember where the food is. At night, they go into a controlled hypothermia to slow down their metabolism. So instead of the energy needed to fly around, zoom, 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 they actually control their metabolism at night. And finding a safe spot at night where they can stay warm is just as important as finding food. The warmer they are, the less fat they have to burn. And finally, number eight is using different life stages. So an example of this is seeds with a thick coat. They survive over winter underground. And once the spring temperatures warm up and the sunlight hits them, they come up and become a completely different thing. The masters of the weird and the wild, though, are insects. If you can imagine a life strategy for winter, insects have done it. They're so diverse. So at the bottom, we see two forms of dragonfly, where you have the adult with wings, and the juvenile right next to it can stay underwater for years. Here we have the Western tiger swallowtail butterfly. They turn into this chrysalis over winter. It looks nothing like it, completely different creature. So that's my quick introduction to wildlife in winter, and we have a little bit of time for questions. Great, thanks, Alicia. Um, so yeah, so uh, uh, just to remind you to everyone that um, you're going to stay muted, um, but please ask questions in the chat um, so we can answer them. We have a few minutes. Um, so there are a couple, looks like a couple questions, Alicia. Mm -hmm. um, so Deb Jack uh, mentions about uh, the snakes. Um, she, has, she thought uh, snakes gather together and share whatever heat they might, might be generated by being in a ball underground, absolutely. question mark. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And in the spring, when they emerge, they'll form these huge breeding balls where they come together and the heat of the snakes attracts each other to the ball, along with all the pheromones that are being released. You'll often find snakes together in the winter and in the early spring, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have some questions about uh, hummingbirds. What about hummingbirds and how much food do hummingbirds eat daily? Um, ah, great question. Yeah, and I think that really varies with the temperature. Again, if it's a super, super cold winter, you'll see hummingbirds visiting the feeder a lot. Tamsin's going to talk more about hummingbird feeder care, but it's important when you think about temperatures dropping and hummingbirds needing to eat, that they have access to that feeder as often as they need it because if you're just drinking sugar water and you don't have fatty things like the chickadees have access to, you're gonna need to eat quite a bit to survive. Okay, then we have a, a oh, questions are coming in here. Um, what do geese eat when they overwinter here in the valley? Naturally, they would be feeding on any sort of pond vegetation or anything that you can find kind of in a natural pond. So one of the reasons why we have such effective overwintering geese is the availability of that pond matter here in the Fraser Valley. Our ponds don't consistently freeze over for long periods of time. So there's access to all sorts of food for them. Okay, um, oh, and um, question about how long is a cycle of a butterfly? Something Ooh. very long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there are different strategies for different butterflies, even. There are some who might reproduce twice in a year. There are some who reproduce once in a year. So it depends on the butterfly. And we have some very interesting critters here in the Fraser Valley. And I wish I could answer that question for all of them. But um, Take a look at some of the insects we have here in the Fraser Valley, and you will be really impressed at the diversity and the many different ways that even butterflies survive here. Okay, then we have a question about owls. Um, it's a good question. Do owls migrate? And if not, how big is their territory? Hmm. Uh, some owls migrate and some don't. So we have some resident owls and some migratory owls. 
the Fraser Valley Conservancy actually has an OWL ID guide on our website. And you can bring it out with you and take a look at all the different owls that you'll see in the Fraser Valley. There's a snowy owl that comes only during winter. Uh, there are some owls that you'll only see in the summer. So lots of in and out with the owls that we have here and some stay year round. Um, and then, so some more questions about hummingbirds, but I think I'll probably be able to address them in my um, section. Great. Um, and then the question about uh, wood frogs, which is not actually, a, I believe, a species that we have here. Correct. Um, yeah, what category do they fall into? Right. So wood frogs, they are amphibians. Amphibians are cold-blooded. So they are a more northern species. And I'm guessing you're talking about wood frogs because you've heard their amazing survival strategy, which is to create a kind of antifreeze in their blood that allows them to basically become frozen and then reanimate. That's an amazing survival strategy. Our frogs and toads here do not use that strategy. They all find a place where they can be underwater or under muck that will allow them to not freeze. If they freeze, they will die. So we don't have wood frogs here in the Fraser Valley and access to safe places to overwinter is very important for our local amphibians. Um, okay, we've got questions rolling in here. Um, are trumpeter swans just passing through or are they overwintering here? I wish I were a swan expert. If and please, people who know about birds, chime in if you know the answer to this. I believe they're migrating through. I don't think they're residents. But I'm sure there are much more birdie people than I who can confirm that. Hopefully, somebody here can help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, so we're just um, keeping an eye on the clock here. If we don't get to all the questions, we'll try and circle back by the end. Um, just mention one, I see one question is, are black squirrels Douglas squirrels too? Um, ah. So we have a native species of squirrel called the Douglas squirrel, and then we have a non-native species, which is the European gray squirrel. And the European gray squirrel will come in the color gray and black. So any gray or black squirrel you see, they're both the European gray squirrel. That's the non-native species. The little brown guy, that's our native Douglas squirrel. Okay, well, think, uh, I think we have time just for one more here. Um, do beavers build dams uh, all year round or do they just try to survive the winter? Ah, so dams are important to create flooded areas and those flooded areas allow beavers to access their lodge. So their lodge is their home where they can come raise their little pups <laughs> and have their winter stockpiles, but the dams are something different. They're to stop water and flood an area so that that beaver lodge, that home, is always protected by water and the beavers can swim in and out of it. I see someone has put an answer in about the swans, that they're on their way to Washington but will overwinter in Delta like in certain flooded areas. So thank you for, for helping answer that. Thank you, bird friends. <laughs> I knew you were out there. <laughs> um, okay, wonderful. Um, okay, I think, um, and are there any brown bears living in the Fraser Valley? And I think you mean grizzly bears. Is that, uh, Alicia, you want to take that one? Um, no. <laughs> okay. well, I think it's, in, well, we've got black bears here um, and brown bears can also, I think if you mean grizzly bears, um, no, they haven't, while well, their range has been expanding, um, it used to be everywhere, but obviously it, it's uh, changed over the years. Uh, I think they are in Squamish now and other areas further east, but I don't think uh, they're, they're in this region yet. Um, okay, well, um, yeah, it's so I think- It's seven o'clock. Yeah, we're gonna, okay, so we'll try and circle back with the other chance for questions um, later, um, but we're gonna move along to um, my section here which is, I'm going to share my uh, screen with you guys. Here we go. Um, so I'll just start the presentation. Give it a moment here. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about tips 
on helping um, critters thrive this winter. And uh, so to really the one thing you need to remember is that critters uh, rely on the same things that humans need to survive, which is uh, we need food to provide energy, shelter for protection, and water to stay nicely hydrated. So the, the first tip we have here is really it just it's good to remember to try to, you know, you want to keep wildlife wild and keep it safe. Um, and, and along that line, you know, keeping uh, feeding animals is, is not a good idea. Um, it can cause problems, um, not just for them, but for us as well. Um, it, by attracting animals, by trying to feed them, like, you know, if, say bears are attracted to garbage or, you know, raccoons, um, they can turn into pests, as we know. And that's not good. And you're, you're changing their, their behavior that they start to anticipate areas where there's food, when really they should be out um, in the natural landscape uh, getting the food they would normally eat. And uh, it's also important to, you know, the food, you don't want to be feeding animals inappropriate food, um, which can be very harmful. So it can promote malnutrition, the things that are not digestible, don't have enough nutrients. And when animals are brought together, it can help spread disease as well. Um, and a good example of this, um, some of you probably have seen, is, you know, the feeding of ducks and geese and that kind of thing in, in parks. And that's something that is, is while it may be fun, um, it definitely not, it's not good for, for these um, birds. Um, and uh, especially if certain foods are very not appropriate. Um, like I mentioned, um, foods that promote malnutrition, um, bread is one of those. So never, you know, bread is just not a good choice. Um, and not only that, but by putting the food out there, you could be attracting in parks, you know, rats and other pests as well. Um, and as well helping to spread disease. So, um, and right now I believe there's a lot of uh, bylaws and things, you know, it's not encouraged to, to do this in parks. And uh, you could, uh, if you're doing it near the water's edge, you could be polluting the environment as well. So yeah, you wanna encourage critters as much as you can to be out there using the landscape for what they're meant to, to do. So, but, uh, and that being said, um, of course I wanna to touch on something that we all love to do which is uh, feeding backyard birds in the winter. And uh, of course, you know, bird feeders, having them out, um, they're wonderful to watch. It's, it's a great a source of entertainment, hours of entertainment watching them. And they are a good thing. Um, in the winter time, they are, it do help supplement the missing food that would have been found naturally in the region um, over the winter months. So they really help the, the birds survive. However, if you choose to have bird feeders, with bird feeders comes great responsibility. <laughs> and uh, it's very important to, the best times of the year to have them are between October and March. So the fall and winter months. This is because this is when they need the food to supplement their diet, to get through those tougher months, to give them the energy they need. But when the spring and summer roll around, there's enough food out there for them to survive. They don't need the feeders to survive. And also it's important that if you are feeding birds uh, with feeders to be consistent with feeding them uh, through the whole time. They get used to knowing where the food is. So they, if they show up and there's no food, they're gonna have to spend energy going out there looking for other sources of food. So you wanna be consistent as well. Now I mentioned, um, you know, you wanna keep, you wanna uh, reduce the, the chance of spreading disease. So you wanna keep those feeders nice and clean. Um, you can use a 10% uh, bleach dilution and that's a really good thing. Um, and uh, otherwise, like this poor little bird here in the corner, this poor house finch, uh, you know, diseases are like eye diseases and things. It, it, they are real and they, they can really uh, harm the birds. And if it snows, like this other picture shows, make sure to clear, make the feeders clear um, so that they can access the, the food as well. And uh, placement of a bird feeder is really important. Um, choose a sheltered location away from the elements. So away from rain, snow, wind. And like this picture shows, you know, see if you can put it near evergreen plants. It has extra shelter. You want shelter for the animals, uh, for the birds to be able to, to fly to if they need to, but as well as some visibility so they can see if any predators are around trying to get them. And I know I just said it's lovely to watch birds feeding on feeders, but if you can, keep them as far away from windows as possible to reduce the chance of window strikes. Um, 
and of course, and if it has to be close, you can try and place them less than one meter away and use decals and ways that birds can um, realize there's a window there so they don't smack into it accidentally. And of course, we're not the only ones that love bird feeders. Our, our friendly pet cats love them too. Um, they see them as a bit of a buffet. <laughs> and so you really want to reduce the chances of kitty uh, causing a bit of mayhem at the bird feeder. And obviously the best way to do this is to have an indoor cat. Um, however, if your cat is outside, either monitor them to make sure they're not causing trouble, or you can also put a, a bell around their neck or a bib or something that will alert the birds that the bird that the cat is around. And then of course, if you want to um, uh, attract a diversity of birds, and I'm not gonna get into the whole different types of, of bird feeders, but just to say, you know, try a variety of bird feeders, different birds feed in different ways. Um, so, you know, try out different things like that. And in terms of bird feed, it's really best to try, you know, these birds need energy. They need high calorie, high fat um, foods. So certain um, uh, seeds are really good. So sunflower seeds apparently are very great, uh, very high in calorie. Um, the best thing to do, because I say, don't want to get into the whole details on this one, but is, is there are local nature stores that you can go in and talk to about what are the best um, seed mixes for different birds, but also suet is popular, um, which you can purchase or you could make. Um, to feed the birds. Although if the weather warms up, you want to make sure it doesn't turn rancid. So just monitor that. Um, and uh, now as fun as it is, you know, it's, it's cute watching squirrels try and uh, attack your feeder. It's, that's very entertaining. But um, in generally, you, you want to you choose feeders that are wildlife proof to stop pests such as squirrels. Um, they disrupt the feeding um, uh, routine of the birds and they just like a mess and, and trouble and, and you just don't want to ideally attract them. Um, some feeders I've seen are, are, are weight bearing. So when the squirrel just heavily heavy gets on, it pushes it down, which blocks the exit of the food. So that's a fun, that's a good way to, to do that. And another thing you wanna be careful about is fallen seed. Um, so a fallen seed, you know, when birds, they can make a mess, drop the seeds, um, those can attract rodents. And if they're near your house, that's a pest you don't want around. So I we recommend you regularly clean up fallen seed. But another thing you could do is put out a tray underneath, collect the fallen seed, makes it easier for cleanup. Okay, so a lot of questions about hummingbirds. And yes, definitely, you know, they're great uh, birds, you know, feed in the winter as Alicia mentioned they, uh, the Anna's birds, they stay year round. They stay year round because of the, the plants in our gardens and because people have been feeding them. And so to feed them, um, you create a sugar water recipe. So four, four parts boiled water, one part white sugar, that's it. You don't need coloring, you don't need honey, you don't need anything else. That's just, just pure sugar water. And again, like I mentioned with the other bird feeders, if you want to feed hummingbirds in the winter, you must fully commit. They really will. They know where that food is and they rely on it. And these, they're high energy birds. They need the, the energy. So you don't want to let them down. But of course, what happens when the temperature drops and your feeders start freezing? Well, um, one thing is I, I, you can buy feeder warmers, which can help, um, or consider buying a couple feeders and rotate them um, you know, during the day and night um, so that this stops, you know, one from freezing. You always put in like lukewarm solution that will hopefully not freeze as soon and things like that should, should help it stay, um, stay free, ice free. And again, I uh, just want to reiterate too about remember to clean these feeders as well to prevent the spread of disease. Uh, it's recommended that you clean your hummingbird feeder once a week during the winter. Okay, so that's my, that's my uh, talk uh, uh, section on, on feeders. So now we're gonna talk, going back to talking about habitats and helping critters in their natural habitats. And as I hope you, you heard from Alicia's talk, that our local wildlife is well adapted to survive um, in our region. And um, the critters are used to taking advantage of the natural landscape around them. But as we all know, looking around where we live, the landscape has certainly changed with housing and development and, you know, so the habitat's not as much as it used to be, but what we can do is we can give back 
some of these habitat features that they may need to survive. So again, I want to reiterate the three basic needs for survival, which are food, shelter, and water. So keep that in mind. So now we're going to move on. So the first thing, I got some good news for you. So the, the, what you need to do to help wildlife is you need to be lazy. Be a lazy gardener. Um, you will be landscaping for nature or naturescaping, as we like to say. So when it's the end of the season and your grass is growing, skip that last mow. Let the grass stay long. If your plants have gone to seed and there's remaining berries, don't clean it up. Just leave it. Leave it for the critters. And so what you're doing by doing this, as this picture shows of the beetle in the grass, is you're providing homes for overwintering insects um, that then when the springtime rolls around, they will provide food for springtime birds. Um, and not only that, but by leaving seeds and berries, you're leaving food for other for birds and, and other you know, small mammals, things like that, that, that to help them survive. So just, you know, just leave it. And also the leaves, leave the leaves. Don't rake up those leaves, just leave them on the ground. Um, or just if you do need to clear them a bit, just leave them in a pile. Um, le leaves are wonderful habitat for, for wildlife and um, especially for overwintering insects. Again, uh, moss, butterflies, those kind of things. Um, and they provide also shelter for critters as well. So just, you know, don't just put the rake away. You don't need to worry about it. Again, um, when in these stormy times, you know, the, the you have branches that come down. Well, you don't have to get rid of them. Um, just uh, collect them together. You can collect them and create a brush pile like this picture shows. And uh, brush piles are great. Um, they provide shelter from the cold for, for various critters and also safety from predators so they can hide. So amphibians and birds and small mammals, it's a great place for them to go. And when Christmas is over, um, with your Christmas tree, provided you have a real Christmas tree and you remove the ornaments, why not put that on your brush pile? And then that's, there you go. It's, it's you know, it, it, you enjoy it even longer. The other, uh, your backyard critters will thank you. And the other thing you can do for landscaping is, is when the trees die um, and a tree, say a tree dies and falls over, you have a log on the ground. Well, you don't have to clean that up. Just leave it to rot. I mean, if you need to move it a bit to get it out of the way, that's fine. Um, and then also, if a tree dies and it's still, the trunk is still standing, you can leave that to rot. Although you can choose to top it at a safe um, height so it doesn't fall on anything. And we call those wildlife trees. And so when left standing, um, wildlife trees are wonderful places for birds to roost. Um, they can create cavities to uh, nest in, but also shelter in for the winter and also provide food source for um, birds as well. And when logs are rotting on the ground, they provide shelter for animals such as frogs and salamanders. So your, your neighborhood friendly amphibians will, will really thank you. Okay, so that's the landscaping or naturescaping as we say. Um, the next point I wanted to briefly touch on is, is water, of course, to hydrate. And what we, we recommend is having an area of clean, accessible water and a bird bath is a great example. Um, you can keep it, you should keep it ice free. And so you have a heated one that can be always good or just, just make sure you keep the ice out of it. Um, and then again, a bit like the bird feeders, make sure it's a location where the, the animals, birds won't get predated, that they have some places to run and hide nearby. So placement is also important when it comes to putting out a, a bird bath. Okay, and then the thing that we always love to recommend is adding native plants. And native plants can have so many benefits in the winter and beyond. Um, obviously, they provide food, shelter. Um, our, our native critters are uh, evolved with them, so they're the best things that they need. And uh, one little tip I wanna point out is a good time to plant native plants is actually the fall. And that's because when the rains come, um, that helps them get established over the winter period. Um, unlike if you plant them in the spring, which you can do, but then you have the summer months coming and you have to really monitor them to make sure that they survive those drier months. So a little more work. So we, we a lot of uh, um, 
conservancy uh, type groups, um, stewardship groups, we do a lot of our plantings actually in the fall. Okay, so I just wanna to touch on a few examples of native plants we recommend. Um, so some provide food, berries, seeds, um, places for insects. Insects will lay their eggs or um, burrow into the, the stems. Um, common snowberry is an example, and this is a picture I took yesterday um, showing just the berries left on the shrubs. And uh, you can, they're not maybe the most palatable food, but uh, when the going gets tough, some birds do find them um, tasty uh, later in the winter. Red your dogwood as a shrub that has nice red um, stems, but also uh, is very good for, has berries and Sitka mountain ash as well. Um, some other examples of um, some, you want to maybe consider planting evergreen shrubs because they provide extra shelter for animals as well. Um, some examples are Salal, which is a lower growing evergreen shrub, tall Oregon grape, which is shown in this picture of this garden with this, it's the sort of taller shrub with the yellow flowers, that's uh, Oregon grape, and evergreen huckleberries, another great example as well. And don't forget that some ferns stay, in, stay evergreen as well, so sword fern, and conifers, which I think there's some in this picture too, um, like Douglas fir trees also are great habitats um, for, for critters over the, the winter as well. Uh, but you don't have to remember all this because it's all in a handy resource guide that the Conservancy created. Um, we have a gardening with native plants guide. It's available for download as a PDF for free on our website. You can also purchase copies uh, through our site as well. And they uh, includes a list of 40 plants, um, native plants, to get you started on your native plant journey. Okay, so that's uh, native plants. And then uh, just to getting here, talking about getting outside um, to get to know nature is a great way to help, you know, to know, understand and know nature is, you know, it's a, the winter is a great time to look for birds and other critters. There's less foliage. Um, you can, when it snows, go out and identify paw prints in the snow. These are prints from a, a hare. Also, um, we highly recommend, we're really getting excited about iNaturalist, which is a website and an app where you can take pictures and upload them. Um, people can help you identify things. It's a way to, um, it's, it's with National Geographic, and it's a way to collect uh, naturalist data from all over the world. I highly recommend you look into it. It's a, it's a lot of fun. And then also participate in stewardship events, although this is maybe not the year to go out and be part of events, but hopefully next year, as I mentioned, a lot of groups do plantings in the fall, so they really could use your help. And um, make a plan, you know, like everything I've talked about, to make a plan for, you know, throughout the year to create habitat. How can you create habitat in your backyard? And leading to that, just my last um, thing I wanted to mention is our the Fraser Valley Conservancy's Nature Stewards Program, which I think some of you are familiar with. And this is a program we offer for free where we will come out and visit your site. Um, if you have habitat, like a bit of forest habitat, wetland stream, old field habitat, we'll come out and give you personalized information and guidance on how you can improve your backyard for wildlife. And we can, if you have specific questions, um, if you saw some bats, you see some frogs, you have questions, uh, we're here as a resource to help you. And with that being said, I think that is, that is the end of my presentation. So happy to take some questions. Great. Thanks, Tamsin. Um, I think if I scroll up, I see some of the earliest questions are if Douglas squirrels and European squirrels are able to interbreed. Um, I can answer that. That's no. Um, they're two different species and they cannot create a hybrid. So the answer to that one, Crystal, is no. Um, this question is, can you use brown sugar or coconut sugar in a hummingbird feeder? Now, I know I've seen um, no to this one. Have you seen anything about that, Tamsin? I have not. I just keep it super simple. Mm -hmm. um, regular regular sugar is, is the way to go, I, just, I suspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, from your native plant section, we got a question about the shorter Oregon grape. 
Um, mm. Is that a good choice as well? Any info yes. on that? Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. That there is the there's two types of Oregon grape. Um, generally, I think landscapers tend to to gravitate towards the tall one, but absolutely, there's a shorter, slightly smaller version that is just lovely. Yeah, and it's a good alternative to say holly. Um, you know, because holly is an invasive plant, so you know it's another good choice to don't choose the invasive. <laughs> Great. Uh, so we got a question here. If hummingbirds need a stronger sugar to water ratio in the winter to give them more calories. I would stick with the, the four to one ratio. That's been the one that's been most recommended. Yeah, you don't need to, to change the percentage uh, during the winter. Right, that's it's what good. I've seen as well. It yeah. can actually be harmful to increase the sugar ratio because it gets to be too much. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this one, do you offer visits to preschools in the Fraser Valley? I'm guessing this is part of the Nature Stewards program. Uh, send us a, a, an email. We can, we can share some, some resources we have for, for schools as well. But generally, it's for private, uh, for people's properties. So, um, but certainly, send us a note and we can, we can connect. And the email, um, I, I, the outreach at Fraser Valley Conservancy email, that's one that I've been in touch with all of you that registered, that's how you can reach us. That's a great way. Great. So this one says, how do air breathing animals live underwater like beavers? Um, and I can answer that one. <laughs> uh, so a lot of creatures who breathe with their lungs, like frogs, uh, they can stay underwater for a long time because their metabolism has slowed down, their body has slowed down, but they still come up to the surface to breathe every once in a while. So they don't stay under forever. They'll stay under for a really long time because their body moves so slowly, but they do come up for a quick breath of air and then back down. So they don't hold their breath all winter. Uh, what about when the pond freezes over? Well, um, you better hope that the water that you're in has quite a bit of oxygen in it. So this is a good example for something like fish. Fish breathe with their gills, and if there's enough oxygen in the water, that'll keep the water safe to live in even when there's ice. Frogs, kind of the same. If you can breathe through your skin, there's enough oxygen in the water that they can survive until hopefully they find a crack in the ice to get that extra breath of air. Okay, this one's for you, Tansen. How far is your reach in the Fraser Valley? Um, well, it, it turns like east or, east or west. Um, I mean, really to the, uh, pretty much anywhere at sort of the Fraser Valley Regional District is, is what we cover. Um, we have gone as far as Langley um, and uh, we consider like Maple Ridge as well. Great. Yeah, as far as up to like Chilliwack and maybe a bit beyond. New West? Question <laughs> mark. Uh, not necessarily at the moment, but but you know, send me a note if you have specific questions. We could we could see what we, at least we can answer and put you on the right path. Uh, so, question about where do slugs go? Like banana slugs. Do you know this one, Tamson? <laughs> um, our, our slugs can hibernate actually um, so if they find a nice spot under logs they'll hibernate and they also lay eggs under logs which can overwinter so the eggs themselves will hatch new in the spring uh, slugs are pretty tough as any gardener will tell you so yes they can survive the winter Uh, if I scroll up, there was a question, how, how does brumating help cold-blooded animals survive the winter? So I can answer that one. Um, brumating helps you to survive by signaling you that it's time to find a place to hide. So if your body temperature is affected by the outside temperature, when it starts getting cold, your body's going to recognize it's time to find a safe place to go. 
So you'll find that safe place to hide under the log before the temperature gets too cold that you can't move anymore. So that relationship with the external environment, the outside will tell you when it's time to move and how you can stay safe. Um, more notes from Erica. Thanks for participating, Erica. Beavers stay underwater for a really long time. Oh yes, so about the beaver lodges. Yeah, so beaver lodges, you can stay nice and warm in a beaver lodge and there's a little hole up at the top to let air come out. Sometimes you can even see puffs of steam coming out the top of that beaver lodge. It stays so warm in there. All right. Um, other insects, ants, ladybugs, worms, pill bugs, all sorts of things. <laughs> they do lots of different things. <laughs> insects do all mm -hmm. sorts of things. Yeah. A, a lot of them do overwinter. Um, like I said, in some of the plants, um, in some of those areas I was talking about. Um, yeah. Great. All right. So I'd say that's it for our questions. And we have one more slide before we finish up. So I won't let you go quite yet. Tamsin has one more thing to say. One more thing to say. Okay. Well, first of all, just thank you so much for participating in our first full webinar like this. This has been great. Um, you know, I look forward to seeing you all in person in the future. Um, and uh, so, but what's coming up next for the Nature Stewardship School? Well, first of all, um, we're, we're thinking about our next one already. Um, our next topic is going to be how to identify amphibians, um, which spring is a great time to do that. We don't know if it'll be in person or online, but stay tuned. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, so with the, I'll be sending you all a survey, um, and that's an opportunity for you to let us know what, you know, give us some feedback. Um, and also let us know if you, if you're not registered already to get our emails that, to let us know if you'd like to, to get them on a regular basis. We, we're, we're, we'll be continuing the Nature Stewardship School in 2021 and hopefully beyond. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, Lisa, is there anything else that I... Yeah, we got one more question from Deb Jack about enriched hummingbird food, pre-mixed or powdered stuff that you can get um, if that's any good. Really what I've seen is the best, 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 best is just that four to one ratio. Is that what you've seen? That's what I've read out was consistent. Yeah, you don't need anything else. Yeah, I know they, they want to sell you things, that's for sure. <laughs> but do, and I would say, you know, for any of this for feeding birds, do a bit of research too. There's certainly um, tips on sort of what, um, feed, what seeds and what feed is best. Um, you know, obviously ask a lot of questions when you go into the store too. Great. Uh, we got a question. If we registered for this, are we on the email list? No, not necessarily. So um, when I send a survey, please make sure that, that you tell me you are, because yeah, then I'll put you on the list officially. Great. Well, 729, and I'd say that oh. ends it. Uh, feel free to send us an email or just get in touch with us at any time if you have any more questions or if you're just interested, uh, we have resources on the Fraser Valley Conservancy website for identification and the native plant guide that Tamsin showed you. So we're always happy to try our best to help you connect with the environment, our critters in the Fraser Valley. Yes, send us your questions just anytime. We're, we're happy to uh, take pictures. If you see anything cool, take pictures, send it our way. We like identifying things as well. All right, and thank Thanks. you everyone so much.